So many of you will remember back in 2008, our theme at Angiogenesis was dry is the new wet. And I think that's come to be understood as the new reality. Dry is the new frontier. And the reason is we knew back then that the patients that we were treating with ranibizumab were doing well initially, like this patient, in 2005, 2050 vision, 2007 after 10 Lucentis injections, 2025. And then what happened? And we continued to follow this patient. And, and in 2008, when we had the meeting, I saw that she was developing increasing geographic atrophy. And now, 57 months after she, we stopped the Lucentis injections, here she is, 2400 vision. And she's disgusted with this therapy. She told me in November, this treatment failed. I'm leaving. I'm not coming back. I can't see. So I think we all agree that this is not an acceptable outcome. And this is the long-term outcome in treating patients with wet macular degeneration. And the growth rate is what you would expect for normal geographic atrophy. At the same time, we were also looking at the Lucentis Marina and Anchor trial data, and we knew from the data that 10% of patients lost vision. And we published recently that this loss of vision was most likely due to the progression of dry macular degeneration just during the two years of the study. So now we treat patients with wet macular degeneration. We convert it to dry, but anti-VEGF therapy, as I tell my patients, and as you all know, is not a cure to treatment. So the goal is to stop the disease progression. I think we all agree on that. But the question is, what's our goal in terms of clinical trials? Ideally, you know, we'd like to preserve the vision, and eventually, we'd like to restore the vision. And that's where the embryonic stem cells come in, and that's for another time and another discussion. But let's talk about preserving vision. Unfortunately, using visual acuity in clinical trials is a very difficult endpoint end because disease progression doesn't correlate to vision loss. And this is just an example from a study we're doing now. Over six months, this patient with geographic atrophy progressed, and the vision remained stable. Well, here's another patient with the exact same area of geographic atrophy, progressed the exact same am amount, and the vision went from 20, 30 to 21, 25. Vision loss does not correlate with disease progression, and it all relates to how close the geographic atrophy is to the foveal center. So we need surrogate endpoints, and we began to appreciate this years ago. Janet Sunnis studied geographic atrophy, Frank in color photography, Frank Holtz used autofluorescence, and the goal is to come up with a surrogate endpoint for disease progression. Well, Alcon looked at slowing the progression of dry to wet in the anacortev acetate study, but that's not a good short-term endpoint. It takes years and many patients. Another way is to show a decrease in the growth of geographic atrophy or a decrease in the Drusen burden, as was done with the laser to Drusen trials. However, we don't want geographic atrophy or choroidal neovascularization. Let's now focus on these two areas. Geographic atrophy, many ways to image ge geographic atrophy. We've been focusing on the spectral domain OCT fundus image. That's the image that's up here. And it's bright because it, it represents the on phos projection of all the reflected light. And as you can see, where there's no RPE, there's more light reflected, and it's brighter. So we've been studying this for a few years. You can see how well the OCT fundus image correlates with the color and the autofluorescence. And it's easily measured because the scan area is 6 by 6 millimeters. So Zohar Yoshur did an elegant study looking at the natural history of geographic atrophy using the spectral domain OCT fun fundus image. You can see how well we can depict the progression. You can see here in the animated progression, and the black area here represents the area that actually enlarged over time around the fovea, but rarely through the fovea, as Janet Sunnis first, first demonstrated. But we had a problem, and this is a problem that was well known, and that is, if you look at different baseline lesion areas, the growth rate increased. That's a real problem when you design studies from a statistical standpoint. This was also shown in the AREDS data. The small lesions grew slower than the larger lesions. It's a problem because as the growth rate de if the growth rate depends on lesion size and the lesions grow larger, they grow faster and faster over time, and it becomes a statistical nightmare, not only in determining your test-retest variability, but also in determining what the expected growth rate is. And in came Bill Foyer. He came up with a simple transformation that solved the problem. You take the square root of the area, and you look at the difference in the area. It's as if you're looking at 
the area of GA as a circle, and you're looking at the difference in the radii growth, and it works. Here's, here's Zohar's data. The dependence is gone. Here's the Othera data, courtesy of their um, statistician, and it's gone. The dependence is, is gone. And here's the AREDS data, and the dependence is gone. So a simple transformation, and you get rid of this one statistical barrier to designing studies. And now we can design shorter studies um, with more significance. And there's another way to look at G geographic atrophy, and that's with the enhanced OCT fundus image, and that's just looking at the light that's reflected under the RPE. And this is an example of what that looks like relative to the standard OCT fundus image, and now we have an automated way of determining that area. And I'm delighted to tell you that as of January 20th, Zeiss Meditech received FDA approval for this new algorithm that's going to be available on the Cirrus 6.0 software release, and you're going to be able to get this representation of geographic atrophy with the automated algorithm. So we have several ways of following geographic atrophy. The square root transformation strategy works with all of them, and they're being used in clinical trials. Now let's talk about Drusen. In the past, we didn't have a reliable way of measuring Drusen, but there is a way now thanks to spectral domain OCT, and thanks to Giovanni Gregori, he developed the algorithm that was able to segment the internal limiting membrane, but also segment the RPE, but he took it to the next level. He developed an algorithm that allowed you to subtract this virtual RPE floor from the segmented RPE floor, and you get a difference map. And this difference map is highly reproducible, and it can get the area and volume of Drusen that elevate the retinal pigment epithelium. Highly reproducible, published in ophthalmology, and what we observed while we were using this algorithm was something unexpected, and that is over a short period of time, like three months, you get this undulation of Drusen. Drusen increase and decrease and increase. As Christine Curcio says, this is an oil spill, and this is just a fluctuation of the oil spill in the back, back of the eye. But then mysteriously, look at that. We're not the first ones to observe this. The Drusen can go away with no obvious sequelae. Wouldn't that be a terrific outcome for a clinical trial? And you can do it in a short period of time. So, we needed to know what the natural history of these Drusen going away, and Zohar Yehoshua did a beautiful natural history study published in ophthalmology in which he showed they were stable 40% of the time, increased 48% of the time, and decreased 12% 12, 12 of the time. This is an example of a stable Drusen population here over a period of a year, and now it's going to be available in the new software release. Everyone is going to be able to follow any elevation of the pigment epithelium using the 6.0 soft software. This is an example of Drusen growing beyond the test-retest variability. And once again, you can see how nicely it's represented here. And when Drusen go away, there are three possible outcomes. You can form geographic atrophy, choroidal neovascularization, or they can go away, like I showed you, without any significant abnormality. So here we have Drusenoid PED going away to form geographic atrophy. You can see how well this is depicted here in the al algorithm. And Drusen can go away, and what's interesting is they go away and then subsequently choroidal neovascularization de develops. It always seems to be this one-two punch. And then Drusen, as I showed you, can just go away. And that happens 4% of the time. A rare event, a great endpoint for clinical trials. So this is a novel strategy for following Drusen progression. We can measure area and volume, and we're testing it in clinical trials. So in summary, decreased growth of geographic atrophy is probably accepted as an endpoint for phase two trials. We hope to apply Drusen burden as a practical endpoint for phase two trials. And now Scott Cousins is gonna tell us how these new treatments are being applied for dry AMD. Thank you very much.